All right, second panel of DragonCon 2014. We have up Chuck. I'm going to say Chuck because you put it in parentheses, yeah. so that means, you know, it's like the thing. It's so I can thing. do that, it's Chuck. You're just Chuck. Uh, he's going to talk about the Cold War and the space race and things like that. And uh, you're a junior skeptic. I was a junior skeptic, <laughs> and we'll find out how that happened. I was gonna, you know, just, just gonna give you the op option to say you're still a junior skeptic, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm still junior in some way. Are you gonna stand? I can, I can stand or sit if you, you prefer. Stand, I need to put a headset mic. Uh, I'll sit. Okay. <laughs> I'll happily sit. Okay. Is this good? Is this good? Okay, I'm going to talk about a picture book, The Cold War and the Space Race, or how I became a junior skeptic. So to do that, I'm going to take you to a magical time when tomorrow the Atom and Ready Kilowatt were going to team up and we would have safe, clean power, too cheap to meter, or it all end in a flash. It starts with this little book right here. Whoops. Hold it right side up. This book published in 1958. It hit the display racks in suburban supermarkets where all the little golden books were sold. And in one day, when I was five years old, I was already something of a skeptic because I had figured out Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and all those and you know everybody says that's where where you start. Well I guess that was a start but the real start came when I was told I could pick out a book and I was encouraged to pick out maybe Little Red Riding Hood or The Engine That Could or one of the other golden books, but this one caught my eye. And I was just learning to read, and I really couldn't read all the words in this book, maybe not even all the words on the cover, but the rocket was something that was fascinating in 1958. So that's the book I picked. So the little golden books were a great great little series of, of books, the classic children's tales, but a few little science subjects. So I was really happy that I, that I picked this one out. And in 1958, the supermarket was just a wonderful, amazing place. They had this great technical innovation. You could step on this black rubber mat and the doors would just magically swing open. But we still had checkers. We still had mechanical cash registers. I and mean, ubiquitous computing, smartphones, all of that was undreamed of. The big dreams were about space, atomic power, and of course, atomic destruction. Well, let's look a little bit at this book. This, these were the things that were just fascinating to me. It shows a man flying in a, in a rocket, which is something no one had, had done before the time this book was published. That, that was really fascinating. Most of these words had to be read to me when I was five. One of the things that was fascinating, too, was... Uh, the space monkeys. Now, I happen to live in Huntsville, Alabama, which is the home of Marshall Space Flight Center, which was the hub of NASA activity in the 50s. And you can actually see uh, capsules that were designed for one or more uh, monkeys. There's also a brewing company there that brews monkey knot ale. They also have Werner von Braun ale. So there's a, a lot of space history where I live, but this was fascinating to me at the time living in Florida and living close enough to see some of the rockets go up. This was the best part for me, though, as a child. It showed children doing various things having to do with gravity. And so I was able to do some of these things as well. 
And in those days, people weren't so safety conscious about their, about their children. Uh, we had in my backyard a 10-foot construction scaffold, and that was our jungle gym. So after having this book read to me, we all had to jump off the top of it. And we experienced gravity for ourselves. But we also experienced things like jumping and running up over the hill. Um, we even begged our parents to go over little hills in the car really fast. And you could talk some of the parents into doing that. My father would do it. And even, even my mother would do it. Um, but she was, she was a bit of a speed demon. I, I think Margaret would probably do it, too, based on her comments earlier. But there was also some good, more advanced science in this book. It showed how this liquid fuel rocket worked and some of the things that were just theoretical at the time. So the, so the book prompted a, a few things, a few experiences, throw, throwing balloons up in the air, seeing them float, you know, jumping off the scaffolding and, and, and running fast over the hills. It was also a time, though, and when I'm asked what spurred my skepticism as a young child, it really has a lot to do with the Cold War. We would hear this sound routinely. And, uh, excuse me? Are we picking that up? We would hear that sound, and that would mean we were under a drill. It wasn't a fire. attack drill and we would uh, queue up in our classrooms and mothers would come with carpools with their suburban station wagons and we were supposed to pile into those station wagons and drive 50 miles away to shelter. We happened to live in an area that was triangulated by three different naval air stations and we were in Florida, very close to Cuba, and of course a prime target. Well, in school they told us how this was all going to be survivable, but we would have our doubts. We'd have our doubts because of things like this that we would see on television. Unfortunately, Quick time is not available and it's not playing. I'm, I'm sorry. But this would be a, typical of the film clips that we would see on television. Things titled like surviving a nuclear attack. Of course, they would show the destructive force of the bomb. And there was all these hopeful scenarios that if you followed instructions and you evacuated, you would survive. Well, as children, we'd also overhear adults talk. Adults would say things like, well, if they drop the bomb, we need to all be prepared just to fly up to heaven because that's what's going to happen. What's going to happen? We hear things like, well, the living will envy the dead. Well, what does that mean? Well, older children and some adults that weren't so discretionary about what they told children would tell us that living through it may actually even be worse than being killed. We would hear things like this on a somewhat daily basis. This would be an announcement for Conrad. Conrad came about because in those days navigation of aircraft and missiles would have been done by homing in on radio beacons. And they would use commercial radio stations broadcasting fairly powerful AM signals that would bounce off the ionosphere to, uh, for guidance. This was, of course, before the days of GPS or satellite navigation. 
So the plan was to shut off all broadcast except on 2 a.m. frequency, 640 and 1240. And that's where you would get your announcements, and those would, those would come on periodically. And if you're familiar with the emergency broadcast system today, it's an outgrowth of this. But when they had drills, you would only hear periodic broadcasts on what they called Conrad. Every home should have one of these. Well, not every home did, but we happen to have this. It's called a survey meter. And my father had one because he was an engineer. And he was um, volunteered into civil defense in order to keep uh, communication and transportation lines open in the event of an attack. Um, this was somewhat disconcerting to us and our family because the mom and the kids were going to go to St. Augustine, Florida, where the shelter would be, and my father would stay behind in the attack area in order to uh, main maintain transportation and communication capabilities using this survey meter. Well, we did get to play with this a little bit. We would find out how much background radiation was in each one of us already and check out different things like the radium dial on a watch and all of that. So it was somewhat of a, of a scientific experience, but it was also very scary as well. Could have made us very cynical. Then there would be things like this in, in the newspaper, a cartoon from the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, a couple of years after uh, I discovered this particular little book. And of course you have our president there ready to push the button, sitting on a hydrogen bomb aimed at the Soviet Union, and this man who we were told was a thoroughly evil, atheistic, nasty little man that was, that was out to destroy us. And of course, the two of them together managed to take us to and bring us back from the brink of destruction. But it was certainly a, certainly a scary time. You, you knew you couldn't count on tomorrow. One of the things that, um, let me back up here a bit. Excuse me. I, I've gotten ahead of myself, but I'll just, I'll just say that one of the things that happened in our duck and cover grip drills, you've all heard of probably of Tommy the Turtle and, and duck and cover is a historical uh, little anecdote. Well, we saw that film routinely, and we were told if we ducked and covered, we would survive. Well, in 1958, I went to a brand new school, and the brand new school had this wonderful architectural innovation called suspended ceilings. It's the first building I had ever been in that had suspended ceilings. And apparently the architects really didn't know how to design for that because in the airspace where you have to have air circulate in any attic, in any, in any building, um, they managed to create a situation that when the wind blew and the temperature was high enough, there was negative air pressure above that suspended ceiling. So a stiff breeze would come through and all the ceiling tiles would just dance. It scared us the first time it happened. And I remember this as a real tr trigger of skepticism. I mean, almost to the point of cynicism. Because those ceiling tiles would dance when a stiff breeze came through. But they would tell us if we put our heads under the desk, when the big bomb went off, we would survive. Even at five and six years of age, we knew that was well, it was a word we couldn't say then, but we knew it was bullshit. So that caused us to have the kind of skepticism that would question authority. And because we were getting all of this information from various places, uh, from, from various sources, uh, we would start to question things. 
I think that uh, this was something that led to the generation of this, that came of age in the 60s and 70s to go through the cultural phenomena that we did. Um, it'd be wonderful to see, you know, more historical studies to look at the roots of that, how far back it goes. And a lot of historians do suggest that the Cold War and, and a lot of those things started us to started my generation to question technology, to question authority. But the hopeful side of this was the space race. And meanwhile, back out in outer space, we would see all the things that were, that were going on in, in the space program and all the forward-looking things we would see. But in the late 50s, there were still people that were expressing a different kind of skepticism, doubt about how could a rocket fly in space? It doesn't have air to, to push against. There were items like this that came in the New York Times to uh, make a retraction from something they had published in 1920. It sounds like a long time ago uh, now, that was only about 40 years ago then. So there were still plenty of people that were, were young people in 1920 still around that had these serious doubts. The New York Times in 1920 had published an article calling Robert Goddard basically crazy because he obviously didn't understand physics. There was no way his rockets could fly in space and that he, he needed to understand Newton's laws better. Well, this came from a profound misunderstanding of, of the laws of motion, yet people still had these ideas. I can remember going to Sunday school, and in Sunday school, we had a Sunday school teacher, an elder in the church, who seemed to be near 100 years old to me. He was probably much younger, but he was certainly of the generation that would have read the newspaper in 1920 and see, see an article like is referenced here, that certainly man couldn't fly in space. Well, to add on to that, although I don't think he believed in the absolute literal interpretation of Genesis in the firmament, he said that God's not going to let those rocket boys fly in space because he believed there's some kind of a firmament, firmament up there. There's some kind of, an, of a barrier, and man just isn't going to be able to pass through that. Well, it wasn't a couple of years later that Yuri Gagarin, was the first human to orbit the Earth. And a report came out, and I'm skeptical of, of the veracity of this report because Gagarin later denied it, but the report was that Russian ground control asked Gagarin, do you see God? And he said, no. Well, our little elder did have a, re a response to that. Um, I think his belief in the literal firmament fell away by that time, but if he had seen God, he wouldn't be coming back because God would just destroy any, anyone that, that saw the, the, the face of God. Um, but it did. It did challenge a lot of people's notions of what the universe was like. And it's shocking to people now to think that there were people even in that time that hung on to some of these literalist quaint notions, but they did. They, they actually did. I am fumbling this thing very badly. Let me go back here. This was one of the things that as a child was just endlessly fascinating. On the left is Ham. And Ham wasn't named Ham because he's uh, a ham, but he was. Quite, quite the little space chimp. 
And I can remember when we were in school and we saw the uh, news reports on, on television because everything, absolutely everything would stop in the classroom when there was anything related to space on television. And this was just the, the mo most amazing thing. Ha Ham, the first American astronaut. Flew, flew in space. We saw that. Um, we we understood even at our elementary school level how much a chimpanzee was like a man, and if he could do it, a man could do it, and and that would uh, that would uh, happen. Then we'd see articles like the the one on the right side of the screen that man moon flight seen seen as the Russian aim. This is when things really started to heat up. And this is when a lot of science curriculum started to be introduced and we got, we got new science books, we got new science teaching, we got a, a lot more emphasis on math and, and other things that launched a lot of people into different branches of science today. It was a very imp important thing and important time for us. But of course, the space race blew away a lot of people's notions of, about what was just outside of the Earth. Um, it, was, it was a time that uh, of endless curiosity for young people um, and something that may be, may be lacking today. Of course, these guys were endlessly, endlessly fascinating to us. When the Mercury program s started, it seemed like we were seeing something about space exploration every, every week on, on television in our classroom, and we would be t talking about uh, that in our, in our classroom. Uh, with the first flights, then of course with uh, John Glenn's first orbital flight and the whole Mercury program. And I was fortunate enough to be close enough where we could drive for a couple of hours and actually see the launches go up. It was very, very impressive. And then the picture on the right happened uh, right where I happened to have the privilege to work uh, for about 10 years at uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. In fact, I had a, a man that, uh, that worked for me there that was an adult on the spot when John Kennedy walked through the, walked through the center and shook as many hands as, as he can. And of course, the man in the center there is Dr. Von Braun, um, who was definitely the father of our, our space program. There's a lot of interesting history around that as well. But how did this really make me a skeptic? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can get this clip to play. I apologize that the earlier clips didn't, and I'm afraid I won't get this one to, get this one to play. But, um, no, I think I would fumble around too much if I tried to connect, connect now. But it's, it's the famous speech. I hope everyone has seen it, but it's this famous speech before Congress where Kennedy said, you know, we will go to the moon before the decade is out. And even though a later event that, of course, drove a lot of cynicism and, and skepticism about the world uh, happened to to uh, intervene and him seeing that dream come true, it did in fact happen. In, in 1969, we saw Neil Armstrong uh, walk on the moon. And uh, of course, that was an, an interesting, interesting time in history. Uh, I, ha I have to mention this because people don't know this and, and realize this, but in, in terms of history, it was an interesting juxtaposition of things. And if you think about, uh, about history and about questioning things, you can see that all come together. That same week of the moon landing was the Woodstock Festival and Chappaquiddick. 
So lots of doubts raised about our politicians, lots of doubts raised about our culture, a great clash between the youth culture coming up, which now seems like ancient history to a lot of you, um, and, and our, our notions of, of, of science and our notions of America's place in the world. That was such a triumph for America. It was such a triumph for science that it really affected a, a lot of people. It's something I think we need to find a way to strive for today. And I'm going to give a call back to where I started this speech and talk, talking about ready kilowatt in the atom and that clean power. We hadn't heard of Fukushima. We had not heard of Chernobyl. We had not heard of, of Three Mile Island. So there was all that great, great optimism at that time that perhaps should have been more well-tempered, although there were scientists warning us about the dangers at the time. And we had, we had politicians and, and commercial interests pushing us in, a, in another direction. Perhaps we needed more skepticism then. Perhaps we need more exploration and, and more skepticism today. Unfortunately, I think we see a lot of people talk about a kind of skepticism that may have grown out of those times, a kind of skepticism that is purely cynical, the kind of skepticism that draws people into conspiracy theories the kind of skepticism that isn't part of critical thinking. Because I think the kind of skepticism that was seeded in me at that time could have, could have led to that if there weren't other experiences that I had later on. Things like learning uh, mathematical logic in college, things like having uh, psychology courses delivered by a man I would call a very good skeptic and critical thinker, probably the first teacher I ever had that really embodied that. The kind of experiences that ought to be part of everyone's curriculum today, and they're, and they're not. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, though, and talk a little bit about is how we can start getting more skepticism in front of elementary school children. One of the things that uh, a lot of local groups do, like the North Alabama Free Thought Association that I'm a part of, that my lovely wife over here is an, is an officer in, it is do educational outreach to children. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had a booth and we did some very, very simple things that I would encourage people that are activists out in their local communities to do. We did very simple experiments. We did one with a non-Newtonian fluid that you can make with cornstarch and water. And kids from preschool up to junior high level were endlessly fascinated with a simple little ex experiment where you make this, it's called oobleck, uh colloquially, and you can, you can search on the web and find out how to make it. But just a tiny little uh, plastic cup full of this fluid. And if you dip your finger into it slowly, it will just go through this fluid like it's water. If you stab it really quickly, your finger won't sink beneath the surface. And if you're familiar with that, you might say, mm, okay, so what? If, if you're a scientist. But if you're a child and you see that and you start explain, explaining a little bit about the science 
to them, they are endlessly fascinated. I think, I think they had a hard time in keeping it on the table because kids would, would get, the, get the cups and they'd want to take it away and there just wasn't enough of oobleck for everybody to have. Other things like a density column, a simple thing like a density column and asking the children, well, why do you think these various fluids are at the different levels? And hearing their hypothesis, you can start to explain the scientific method Another one they did that's very, very simple and ought to be in every elementary school is microwaving a bar of ivory soap. And you ask the children, what do you think will happen? What happens? When you microwave a bar of ivory soap, it turns into almost like a mound of snow because ivory soap is pure soap and it has air whipped into it. Most of the kids, you know, their hypothesis is it will melt. I think that's what most of us would think. If you put a bar of soap in a, in a microwave, it's going to simply melt. Well, they get to learn the idea about how you empirically test a hypothesis. Goes along wonderfully with the little clip that uh, Professor Feynman does about how you do science. And, and I, love, I love that clip. You make a guess, you test it. If, if you're right, you're right. If you're wrong, it's wrong, and you make another guess. And you can explain, start to explain the scientific method that simply to school children. To see kids walk away fascinated by that is wonderful. It's a little bit heartbreaking to realize they're not going to get those experiences in their classrooms. They're just, they're, they're not going to get that. I'm ready to take questions. We have plenty of time left. We have nearly a half hour left. I know people want to get, um, have a lunch break because it's about lunch time. But I would be happy to take questions for up to the next half hour. So anyone that would uh, like to ask, ask a question, uh, you can step up to the microphone. And I'll take, question, I'll take questions about, about anything. I'll tell you a little bit, little bit about myself that might, might spur some questions, so some things we probably should have covered in the introduction. I'm, I'm Chuck Miller. I live in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm the regional director for American Atheists there, among my many jobs. I'm also a semi-retired consultant work, working with the defense and space industries there. Um, I'm also, I also mention a little bit about my activism, uh, kind of as a callback to the previous panel. Uh, as you can imagine, Alabama is one of the most religious states in the country. And I'll tell you a little bit about something that really has n nothing to do with this presentation, but I'd really like to share with you. One of the things, of course, we're looking at is the whole idea of uh, invocations before city and county commissions and being inclusive of, of everyone. Um, I had heard a complaint that the Madison County Commission was not uh, being inclusive. They were not complying with the recent Town of Greece uh, ruling about inclusivity, about not having secretary and prayers. So, so I went, I observed, and of course they weren't. They had a Methodist pray in Jesus' name, which is, a, which is a strict violation. That I expected. What I didn't expect happened during the meeting. If you can imagine, a county commission voted a grant to give technology money to a private Christian school. A clear, clear, clear violation of the Establishment Clause. 
in thinking about, you know, my own experiences as a child uh, in elementary school in becoming a skeptic. I remember the time when we stopped having mandatory forced prayer in school as a result of the, of the rulings in 1962. I was, I was floored. I was flabbergasted. I had to suppress all kinds of reactions because I was sitting next to a television camera. And this outrageous, outrageous uh, violation of, of, of everything, every, every American principle I can think of, wasn't covered on television. Not a mention of it. This, pa this grant passed by a five to one voice vote. Only one commissioner objected at all. And the commissioner that was requesting it said, we've done this before. And I know without having to look the children in that school are not being taught any critical thinking school skills. They're not being taught to question things. They're not being taught to think for themselves. And my tax dollars are going to support that. And I'm just completely, completely outraged. I'm completely outraged because it's completely foreign to the experience I had in public schools in the 50s and 60s. That was unthinkable then. And now there's so much pushback. And, and, and I don't want to make this sound negative. And I don't want to make this sound like this is at all everyone's experience everywhere. Because I think it's indicative of a strong pushback. Because I really do think that science and reason is winning. I do think that people that are science deniers, and, and this is the way I'll put it, people that are science deniers in terms of climate science, in evolution, in everything else that they're pushing back on are losing. And I think they're circling the wagons. And I think they're pushing back harder. But at the same time, there are hundreds of thousands of children coming up through this a parallel homeschool and private school educational system that are being denied the experiences that we used to have in public school. And I honestly think that the public schools are failing at this as well. And the only way it's going to change is for people like us sitting in this room getting involved. And the way to change it is for people to elect people to school boards that are science-minded that are critical thinkers, that are rational people, and for people like us to run for those school board positions. In some places, it's hard, but, but I'll, I'll tell you this, in talking to uh, political operatives across the country, school board members can be some of the most influential people in terms of what happens in the educational system. And there are people that are in, in the community of science deniers that are deliberately running for school board positions in order to push their agenda. School board positions, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna name a figure it's going to sound high, but it's really not if you run a grassroots campaign. And the figure is what it costs to, to win a school board seat. It costs about $35,000 to run for a local school board seat anywhere in the country and win. 
And that's a lot of money for any of us to reach into our pockets and pull out. But it's not a lot of money if you go door to door and find like-minded people and collect $5 at a time. And it can be done. Much bigger offices have been won that way. Lawton Childs won the governorship in Florida on just such a basis 20 years ago. And you can still do it today where retail politics can be, can be practiced. And you're dealing with retail pro politics at the, at the school board level. We've, we've got about 20 minutes left. I'll ramble on and on and talk about why we need critical thinking, but I will take questions. About um, students in schools now not getting the kind of critical thinking and science focused um, curriculum and I've actually noticed kind of a trend in the last few years of more emphasis on STEM and mm -hmm. you know kind of in the common core curriculum a lot of you know that's being implemented in a lot of states a lot of shift into having more science based and nonfiction text to me, that sounds like a positive step, but I'm curious if you know any details about that, if you think they're, they're moving in the right direction or if there's a flaw in kind of the efforts to, to bring science back into schools. I don't want to sound completely negative because I've seen, I've seen STEM in some schools. Uh, in Huntsville, we have a magnet school. It, it's an interesting mix in the mag magnet school. It's science and foreign language, uh, but given Given the Huntsville community, it's kind of understandable because Marshall Space Flight Center is a, it supports the International Space Station. We have Russian, Japanese, uh, fr uh, European, so we have French-speaking, German-speaking, Dutch-speaking people all working at the center and, and their children, some of them in, in our public schools. And then also uh, we're very science-minded. But it's a relatively small school. It has a good STEM program. Um, I was a judge at a competition for the region, and that school stood out among the rest. So I would say in our area, there are pockets of that. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what this competition was about. It was, um, it was building a future city. That particular school won the competition in the region. They went on to place uh, number one in the state and go to the national competition. Um, they were by, they had by far the best model city. It, in, it included technology, it included culture, it included a lot of elements that would, that would go into a future city. What the other schools were doing was dismal, was disappointing. There was one school that had two entries, a public school, and the future city was heaven. It was literally heaven. So you see this great contrast. So I think there are schools that do STEM right, and there are schools that check the box. Common Core is another big issue. There's huge pushback from the science-denying community on Common Core. I recently saw an article where homeschoolers were pushing back on Common Core. Now, I don't understand that because it doesn't affect them, but there's a huge political movement against Common Core. And they'll lose in many states, but I happen to live in a state where, although Alabama adopted Common Core, there's huge pushback, and they may walk away from it. They may walk away from, from Common Core. I think the homeschoolers and this parallel private, um, in I hate to call out religion, well, no, I don't hate to call out religion, <laughs> but religious education pushes, pushes back on Common Core even though it doesn't affect them. I think at some level they realize that if Common Core is common, their children are going to be at a disadvantage, but they don't see the dis they don't, they don't see the disadvantage um, in perhaps the way that they should. They don't see the disadvantage in, in that they will have uh, less 
they'll be less competitive in the marketplace. I think they'll see that their that their children will be pushed away by what they see as a, a force that's against their worldview. So I I, I think in I think, I think STEM education is going to work for some children. But even in Huntsville, which is a bubble in Alabama, where you have a lot of, of engineers and scientists sending their children to school and, and wanting that kind of, of education, you're only going to see it in, um, you're only going to see it in the magnet schools in a place like that. So I'm I'm optimistic for some, but I'm kind of pessimistic in what I'm, what I'm seeing, uh, seeing where I live. Um, I can't extrapolate that, though, though nationwide. Thank you. You're making me glad to live where I do. <laughs> Hi. Can you tell us about some of your experiences as a prominent member of an atheist organization in the state of Alabama? Uh, for example, the school board vote that you mentioned, uh, giving money to a private Christian school, was there a response to that? Or is there, are there any other uh, notable conflicts that, that your organization has had with public officials? Public officials? Um, I'll give you a per, I'll start with a personal one. I was appointed to be IT director for the city of Huntsville until they read a blog and saw the word atheist. And the offer was withdrawn before my first day on the job. Is it that against the law? It is against the law. And there's possible legal action there. It's also tremendous, it's also tremendous political capital, which I'll use and I'll, I'll speak about how we're, how we're going to use that when I talk about the, the other aspects of, of what you brought up. Uh, it, it is, it's kind of dicey. Alabama's what they call an employment at will state. So I could potentially go back and force them to hire me and then they could, then they could dismiss me under another pretext. So it's, it's problematic. It's very problematic. But as political capital, and of course, this right after that happened, I got offered the uh, regional directorship for American Atheists. So uh, I, glad, I gladly took that and gladly took on the cause. Um, this really in the venue to go into all the aspects of, uh, in all the legal issues that we would have in Alabama. I'll focus on the, on the schools and the educational ones. I'm certain that what I saw was not the only instance of taxpayer dollars being illegally funneled to a private Christian school violating the Establishment Clause. I'm certain of that because in the debate, the commissioner that um, had proposed it when he was asked, well, isn't this a private school? He snapped back, well, it's open to the public, which it happens not to be. There is, uh, there is a, a faith test to be admitted as a student to the school. And then when he was questioned a second time, by the commissioner that represents my district, so I think I'm going to vote for him again. He snapped back again, well, we've done it before. Well, we're going to find out how many times they've done it before, and we're going to take legal action about that. And we're going to try to find out where it's happened in, in other school districts in Alabama. In Alabama, it, it's hard because there's over 80 school districts because as a um, legacy of the segregation days, every locality still has two school systems. There's a city school system and a county school system in every county. Um, and they're still largely r racially segregated. But that's another issue. Yes? You, you mentioned earlier that you had a, a psychology teacher or something that, that you found really helped you in 
um, learning critical thinking skills. I'm curious what um, specific types of methods or techniques or whatever it is that, that really worked for you. I've got two little girls and I would love to figure out how to deal with that. So um, any, anything you can offer on that would be useful. Well, that course was at the college level, as I mentioned. It was a really interesting experience because um, I sat down in the class, classroom. Um, a young woman sat down next to me who happened to be very religious. I did not realize she was that religious because we had only met uh, a couple of days before. But I was quite flattered she chose to sit sit down next to me in the classroom. But the professor got up and he made something that might have been strategically a mistake. Because first he announced that he was an atheist. And she nearly hit the suspended tile ceiling. Because she was uh, she was a Southern Baptist, and she didn't she didn't like that too much. Uh, we had to talk a little bit out, outside the classroom. She was ready to drop the class. I talked her into not dropping the class more because I wanted to be in the class with her than anything else. But the good thing that he did is he started off and he talked about ESP which of course was a big hot topic in the 70s. So he, he talked about ESP and he said, well, we're gonna talk about ESP, but you're gonna find out it's all bullshit. And here's how you're going to l learn about it. We're going to learn about SP. We're gonna learn about sensory perception. And then he was going to explain how all the ESP phenomena could be explained by sensory, sensory perception and um, other psychological factors, which he proceeded to do in the, the first unit of the course. Uh, he talked a lot about the scientific method as well in debunking a lot of things that were going on in, in parapsychology, um, which, which was a good thing because a lot of psychology te uh, teachers in the in the 70s were really into the parapsychology movement. So having that as my first psychology course was a good foundation. And I think if you can um, do it, and he did it in, in an engaging way, um, it, it, can, it can be effective. For younger children, I think it's as simple as doing little simple experiments like I talked about that NAFA does at, at their uh, demonstration booths at home. Uh, the James Randi Foundation has a great elementary curriculum that you can get by going to, and you can uh, see it going to JREF. I think we had, I think we had outlines and some of the materials here in the skeptic track last year. Um, so there are materials out there, junior skeptic for kids that are older elementary, you know, take Skeptic Magazine. My son loved that when he was in elementary school because I, I would get Skeptic Magazine and he would grab it and go to Junior Skeptic and read it. And um, if he didn't do all the experiments, he'd at least consider them and read about them and, and have questions. Oh, yes. So something I've noticed, of course there's extremists, but with religious education, uh, that some, this push to kind of take science down, um, for some people I feel like it's come because of them feeling like they've had that being pushed out of schools with religious freedoms. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, went, I grew up in Germany and in my school there, we had a religious period. You chose um, like three different options, ethics or free period, and the parents decide what you had. Um, and I, I think about how if perhaps instead of having this battle for one or the other, 
if you could find a way to work together, you know, maybe have a small period where you, they can choose, you know, and uh, hey, ethics is good to, for children to learn anyway. You know, we need to be able to work together as well as be able to think for ourselves. And I was wondering what you thought about this sort of kind of compromising ideas. Germany and, and most of Europe is, is a little bit different <laughs> in that you don't have separation of church and state. And that makes it problematical to do something like that um, in America. There are provisions, there are legal provisions where children can get release time from school and they could go to um, a religious school. It happens, in, it happens in some districts. It happened more it happened more in the 50s where there were a couple of cases about that. Um, personally, I'm not opposed to the idea of teaching comparative religion in the schools. I'm not opposed to teaching the Bible as literature. Um, the Bible was another another trigger for my skepticism. I was a lot like Todd Stiefel's children in in reading the Bible as a child and then certainly as, as an adult. Um, I, I, I think that, um, you know, someone doesn't inevitably go off in one anti-science, anti-reason direction just because they've read the Bible. I think you can read the Bible and wind up going in that direction if, if you read it with a critical eye. Um, but having, having strictly religious instruction in schools can be, can be problematic. I think there'd be a way to teach, to teach ethics, um, yeah, you know, secular. without secular ethics, without religion, uh, because, you know, ethics and morality really aren't a religious subject. When, when you come down to it. Um, you know, the, the idea of, uh, of what, they, what you describe is, um, is, is possible to accomplish in America, but it's problematic. And our schools are terribly, terribly understaffed and underfunded compared to the rest of the world. We are so far behind in education. We have other, other issues that we have to address. Uh, one of the things that we see in, in schools is that um, th there is some overlap with religion that doesn't necessarily accomplish the goal that, that you're talking about in terms of uh, uh, ethical education. Things like school books in Alabama that teach the biblical account of the Exodus in Israel as fact when any decent historian will tell you it is not fact. Everything else that touches on any other religious subject is taught as, well, if there's anything out of the Quran, it's, well, according to the Quran, this and this and this. Anything that's out of the Bible is fact, 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 fact. Um, so that's, so one of the big strong points of, you know, that uh, many religious um, people, you know, go say that religion, without religion, there's um, no, you know, you don't learn morals and this and that and whatever. And so, yes, so we, you know, we can, we don't need them, but th for some people, that is a way that they learn these, these traits and, and, you know, what's important in, in our society. But, so that's why, like, I would think that, um, to teach it, if it was taught in school, to teach it not from this factual book relation, but from this idea of, you know, what's right and wrong. And if that's the only place someone's getting their morality from, from their religion, well, go ahead, have at it, uh, but it's not really where it comes from. Uh, secular people's moral values come from the same place that religious people's moral values come from. 
come from society. They, some people that are religious just don't admit it. Oh, 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 oh